from the SiliconANGLE Media office in Boston, Massachusetts. It's the Cube. Well, hi everyone. Welcome to this review of the sixth annual Future of Cloud Computing Survey, brought to you by Northbridge Venture Partners, Northbridge Equity, and by uh, Wikibon. My name is Paul Gillen. I'll be your host and moderator. And the question is, where's the cloud going? Well, there's no shortage of opinions on that these days. You can find lots of research to that effect, but what really matters is what the customers think, and that's what Northbridge uh, Growth Equity and in, in uh, conjunction with Wikibon went out to survey more than 1,400 customers, end users, companies that are building their businesses on the cloud to find out where they think the cloud is going where they stand on public versus private cloud. How much data are they putting in the cloud? What do they think of those questions of cloud security? Those are all issues we're going to address in this review webcast, looking at this sixth annual Future of Cloud Computing Survey. The second webcast, the second one is co-sponsored by Wikibon and by Northbridge Growth Equity. Now joining me right now are Holly Maloney McConnell, who is a partner at Northbridge Growth Equity, and Stu Miniman, Senior Analyst at Wikibon. Um, Holly, why don't we start with you. Tell us a little bit about Northbridge and about what you do. Sure, no thanks, thanks so much for having me. Um, so I'm a part of our uh, growth equity team at Northbridge and what we focus on is partnering with growth stage technology and tech enabled services companies that have achieved revenue scale, typically tens of millions of revenue and have actually been really capital efficient to get there. So looking for a partner to help accelerate growth and, and take advantage of these uh, really big market opportunities a little bit faster. What's your interest in this topic? So I help to lead our efforts in, in, in cloud, um, security, open source, uh, and infrastructure investing across our, our growth equity landscape. And, and I'm lucky to have a number of my portfolio companies having participated and sponsored uh, the survey today. Stu, leading cloud analyst, uh, a guy that, that many companies turn to for insight on where the cloud is going. Tell us a little bit about what you do at Wikibon. Sure, thanks Paul. Uh, so I span between really kind of infrastructure and cloud computing, and that really sits right at the core of what we're looking at the survey here. As people are trying to sort out this kind of multi-cloud, hybrid cloud world, uh, you know, what does that all mean? Uh, Holly and I were actually at AWS reInvent a couple of weeks ago, so we got a good Kool-Aid injection of where public cloud is, uh, and really been looking about, as you said, Paul, some of the inhibitors, some of the opportunities at Wikibon, we love helping companies take advantage of that you know, next generation of technologies and love ha hearing how practitioners are learning from their peers and that's where it was great to kind of swim in this data. And coming as you did from the, a huge reInvent conference, it'll be interesting to contrast the opinions that are expressed by the real customers in this survey with, as you said, the Kool-Aid that they might be drinking from Amazon. Uh, let's take a quick look at the agenda with the next slide. We're going to talk about demographics uh, first, the emphasis on uh, cloud strategy, cloud technology in use today, where data lives, drivers behind cloud adoption, <coughs> also inhibitors to cloud adoption. I think you'll see some interesting changes there. Uh, the expectations of where the cloud is going, and finally, where customers are investing their, their dollars. A uh, quick look at the collaborators on this project. This project had 53 collaborators, companies that are all interested to different degrees in the future of the cloud. They uh, volunteered their time, their customers, their reach to help get a, a record response to this survey. And uh, we continue to look, uh, Northbridge continues to look for more collaborators as we move forward into subsequent surveys. Uh, really, the bigger the better. Uh, the bigger the pool of responses we get, the better the quality of our, of our uh, data. A uh, quick look at uh, demographics. This was a record-breaking survey, 1,351 responses compared to 952 last year. Uh, Holly, were you surprised by that number? Was uh, what do you to what do you attribute this great response? Yeah, and I think it was it was really great to see um, the increase in, in users versus vendors. I think in uh, surveys in the years past, we've seen a, a real emphasis on on the vendor side, but it's great to see um, the voice of the users actually coming through and really uh, describing how they are using cloud today in their business. They're, on the vendor side. You know, typically these companies may be using the cloud to, to deliver their products and services to market, um, but actually having the user perspective is, is really helpful. And I think one thing that was really interesting is that you know, we saw um, uh, respondents from eight or nine different uh, industries, um, which includes things like government and healthcare and manufacturing, 
um, and, tr and transportation. So some of these industries that maybe have been viewed as uh, as, as laggers in adoption of, of, of cloud are really embracing that as they look to digitally transform their businesses. And 60% of the respondents were, in fact, users. And as uh, Holly mentioned, uh, some kind of old line manufacturing uh, industries in their companies that you don't think of as early adopters of the cloud, but I think you'll see from these results that they are they're moving much faster than they're often given credit for. Yeah, Paul, t just to uh, add to what Holly was saying, uh, one of the things we noted last year in the survey is the line between kind of the vendor and the user tends to be blurring. We especially see that uh, in the open source space where kind of the, you know, every company is becoming a software company and everybody's collaborating on a lot of what's uh, happening there. So, uh, you know, really interesting when you kind of look at how people view themselves, view their company and where their revenue comes from. And we will be asking you to speak to some of the cross tabs here because some on some of these responses we might believe that they're being uh, skewed by, by the number of vendors in the sample, but in fact we found that there was a surprising amount of unanimity I believe, between how users responded to the survey versus vendors. Were you surprised at that at all, Holly? Um, I mean, a little bit, but again, and not really, just as we're seeing, you know, the pervasive usage across the board of, of clouds that people can really, you know, stay ahead from an innovation perspective and really, you know, using the cloud to, to try things, try things quickly um, and, and, and innovate across the board. So yeah, all companies are yeah, becoming yeah, software yeah, companies. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Let's get to it. Let's take a look at that first slide. Uh, still uh, less than half, half of the technologists uh, we surveyed say that they are cloud first or cloud only, but I don't know, I, I think, in, in my opinion, this is looking at the, the small number is the is the important one, which is 42% of our respondents said that they are cloud first or cloud only. When you consider that the cloud has only been a, uh, a major factor in the market for the last four or five years, that strikes me as a very fast, uh, rapid adoption, a, a shift in attitudes. Stu, what, what do you make of this number? Yeah, well, Paul, it, it definitely is uh, kind of a little bit surprising, but the last few years we've seen uh, the U.S. government, we've seen big banks, we've seen you know large enterprise companies, not just you know startups, gaming, mobile companies uh, that kind of were born in the cloud, but lots of companies that are saying we understand uh, the advantages of cloud. And one one bit of nuance on this, you know, when we say cloud, this does span not only public cloud but private cloud. So uh, if if you go to most IT departments and say, are you doing cloud? Their answer better be yes. Uh, but uh, as it notes in here, um, we are still kind of getting from some of the tactical ways that we've been handling cloud to a more strategic view, uh, and I think that shows out in the numbers as to people are still ki kind of using cloud as you know a hammer uh, certain times to take care of certain things, and, and others, it's, it's a full strategy. They understand what they're doing. I've talked to many uh, large companies that have now you know worked through their justification, understand how they're uh, doing, you know what they're sassifying, what they're doing on-prem, and what they're doing in the public cloud. Let's get that slide up on the screen so uh, so people can see the uh, the resulting numbers. I do want to follow up with you on that, Stu, because Wikibon has coined this term true private cloud uh, as distinct from virtualization, perhaps, which which uh, uh, some people might have said was cloud. Uh, do you think that, the true pri that, that these uh, cloud-first companies are talking about true private cloud? Yeah, and, and Paul, I, I've talked to a number of companies that have kind of worked through that hurdle as to what's more than virtualization, how am I doing orchestration, how am I doing kind of the uh, you know automation in these environments. I know towards the end of the survey deck we're going to talk about the DevOps movement and what's happening in that space, but it's more than just a point technology. Uh, it's really uh, the consumption model of how I'm dealing with things, uh, how both I'm consuming it and my internal constituencies, how I'm providing services to them, because uh, it's really about the data and the application and how I can do that faster, um, not just have you know the same old stuff that's been sitting on the shelf for ten years. Uh, and when the answer, when somebody says I want something new, the answer is no, or it's going to take me you know twelve to eighteen months to get that done. Mm -hmm. Holly, as you look toward, toward companies that you're investing in, uh, when you see this kind of shift happen to cloud first, what implications does that have for the market, for startups, for companies that are are offering these kinds of services? Yeah, I mean, I think really what it allows for is just a, a continued you know, increase in the, in the pace of innovation and, and really how they think about their strategy internally as you were, you kind of um, lended to the, the DevOps movement. It's really figuring out how that becomes a key part of their strategy built into the, the product development organization um, such that, you know, communications across the board needs to, um, needs to amplify so that you can take advantage of the cloud while still, you know, kind of maintaining uh, cost and, and minimizing risk. Um, while, while increasing agility, and so I think there, there, there are a lot of things that need to, to happen simultaneously, and so having um, a, a really solid 
cloud governance strategy is increasingly important for, for the companies with which we're working. And I think um, this number of, in terms of you know 42% approaching 50% of, of cloud first or cloud only uh, really also speaks to the, the pace of innovation that we're seeing from traditional IT buyers in terms of them acquiring um, uh, you know, cloud-based applications, they can really kind of fortify their cloud strategies internally. Um, you know, one recent example that we saw in our portfolio was, was Oracle's acquisition of, of, of Dyn, uh, announced acquisition of Dyn, uh, which is a company based in, in Manchester, New Hampshire, which is a, a premium managed DNS, internet performance management platform, um, and really acquired this business to, to be the, the cornerstone and, and basis, basic foundation of, of their cloud strategy going forward. Uh, let's move ahead to the number, the slide that uh, that I think, um, and we'll move one further, one more slide ahead. Uh, frankly, this surprised me the most w when I saw this. This sort of knocked me back on my feet. 42% uh, of companies say they drive 50% or more of their business through cloud-based applications. Now, my re initial reaction was, well, this is heavily influenced by vendor respondents, but you did the cross tabs and found out that that's not the case. So um, wh how is this manifesting itself? You say re getting business from cloud applications. What kinds of applications do you think are driving this, uh, uh, this growth? Yeah, I mean, I think we're, you know what our survey results sh showed was that you know 75% of business functions are moving to or already in the cloud. So that's things like marketing and, and CRM, um, uh, which are certainly enabling uh, sales among uh, distributed number of, of organizations. Um, also, you know, cloud-based e-commerce platforms are increasingly um, you know table stakes for for um, you know businesses to really grow online. Um, and we're also seeing on the vendor side. I mean, the vast majority of companies that we're looking at at Northbridge Growth Equity are, are providing cloud-based applications that is their business. So they are inherently you know, generating certainly much more than 50% of their revenue um, through cloud-based applications. And, and what I'll add to that, Paul, is you know, every conversation we have with companies these days, it's about where are they with that digital transformation. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you know, the, the wave of mobile that we've been talking about for you know, a couple decades now uh, ties into all of this. You know, th there, there are very few companies that are not affected in some way or another uh, by you know, mobile, cloud, uh, you know, the, the new sources of data mm -hmm. uh, and, and everything that's, that's in this space. Well, as you talk about digital transformation, you know, maybe the great buzzword of 2016, but nevertheless, something that companies are fixated on. Uh, do you believe the cloud is is the enabler for digital transformation, and can you transform digitally without having a cloud foundation? Yeah, I, I mean, did we talk for how yeah. long do we talk? It's like, oh, you know, what's a what's an internet company? Uh, you know, cloud is just one of those you know substrates, that foundational layer uh, that so much is built on today. Absolutely, and you know, we're seeing these companies engage in. Uh, you know, what is the fir just the first couple of years of, you know, five, ten year digital transformation um, projects and, and, you know, certainly, you know, cloud is, is the enabler of that and driver of, of, of that strategy. I wonder, if, Holly, maybe you could speak to some of the companies that you're investing in. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you see business models that, uh, that you think are especially innovative or unique that are enabled by the cloud that perhaps were not, uh, uh, were not possible in a more traditional on-prem environment? Yeah, I mean, I think I think one business model um, shift that we are seeing is is this you know adoption of of high velocity, low touch um, sales models, um, such that um, because the way these you know cloud applications are architectured and consumed, um, they can really be self serve environments. And so you know examples of of you know companies being able to drive their business both at the low end, so this this you know again high velocity, low uh, touch sales model, um, while also um, you know being selectively uh, going through channels at the high end enterprise and really the mix of this business model is really enabled by again the self-serve service delivery models that the, the cloud drives. Yeah, and at AWS reInvent, the whole discussion around the AWS marketplace was was mm -hmm. a huge piece. Uh, companies that were just selling online now, I need to be part of these marketplaces. Uh, one thing we've been looking at for a number of years is, you know, will there be an enterprise app store out there? Uh, because you know, I, I'm doing my CRM in the cloud. I'm mm -hmm. doing so many other of my applications in the cloud. What other services uh, does the business want to have access to and make it just it, that reducing friction to be able to take advantage of those new services and move faster. And, and a much more efficient business model, but uh, but one that's very different from what we've had in the past. And traditionally, software companies you know, would have a large direct sales force mm -hmm. or a channel uh, force. And what we're seeing is these marketplaces now beginning to take on some of the role that that, that used to play. Um, how does this affect the, the, the way uh, uh, software is, is sold in the future? 
Well, I, th I think it certainly speaks to the way in which you know software is, is architected. It has to be really easy to use and intuitive um, from a user perspective, so they can go to a marketplace, understand the underlying value proposition, and then make a, a decision in, in fairly um, short order, um, just given the the time constraints that they may be under internally. Um, so, uh, you know, delivering these kind of beautiful, simple user experiences is is increasingly important. Stu, does this change the balance of power in the software industry? Is Amazon increasingly the uh, uh, the power broker for those companies that rely on the marketplace for their, their livelihood? So t today, I, Amazon's at about a $13 billion run rate, but their shadow on the marketplace is much larger than that. Um, and as, as Holly was saying, you know, I need to have a good interface. I need to be able to pick it up fast. I, I shouldn't have to train my people too much on it. Uh, and you know, how do you become sticky anymore? If I'm just paying by the drink, if it's something that I could, you know, switch to a competitor pretty easily, uh, that what you hear from SaaS companies and, and you hear from Amazon is if you're not proving yourself time and again and every month, you know, the customer can go switch to someone else. So um, the balance of power, it, it's shifting, but it doesn't mean that it's all going to the vendor side. Users now have a lot of opportunity. I know we're going to dig in here about, you know, what is, you know, where is portability, where is lock-in is a concern that lots of people are having. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it, it, it's definitely nuanced and things are shifting really fast. Um, and it's one of the things I'm really, uh, you know, having fun with this data is understanding, you know, what's really shifting fast. Some of the go-to-market uh, yeah. is, is really changing and it's such an amazing pace. And, and to your point about stickiness of, of solutions, it really highlights the increasing importance of customer success organizations within these um, you know, SaaS-based um, companies because that retention is increasingly important as you think about the overall you know, cost of acquisition of customers. It's always much less expensive to keep what you have than going and acquiring net new businesses. And so um, these customer success organizations are, you know, uh, themselves are digitally transforming um, and taking advantage of, of, of cloud-based applications to, to deliver much better service to their customers. And as we'll see in later slides, uh, the uh, fear of lock-in is actually growing mm -hmm. as, as a concern, as an inhibitor. Let's move on to our next slide, uh, reaching equilibrium in public-private hybrid. As you uh, come away from Amazon reInvent, you might believe that public cloud is the be-all and end-all, but this, as this slide would indicate, hybrid is still very much the, uh, the model of choice, and in fact, public cloud, uh, between these last two surveys, has actually dropped off a little bit as a preferred deployment platform. Um, would either of you like to speak to to these uh, to, to what this means to uh, to the way cloud is developing? Sure, I, I'll start, Paul. So first of all, even Amazon themselves, how they define hybrid has changed year over year. So this year, uh, you heard Amazon one talking about how they can put VMware on AWS in 2017, and two, they start pushing out to the edge. Especially there, there's uh, when if you talk about IoT, Internet of Things use cases, uh, Wikibon CTO David Floyer has been kind of beaten on the on the table for the last year and saying that you know most data, like 80, 90 plus percent of data will be created at the edge and therefore I can't just move it all to the center. If you talk about you know just data and storage itself is heavy and moving it you know just from the laws of physics is, is tough to do. So um, it will be a hybrid world, but what that means varies depending on who you talk to. We, we've been saying for many years, you know, uh, there are very few companies in the world that are really good at building data centers, so if you're an IT staff, you probably shouldn't do that. You should partner with somebody, go to a managed service provider, go to a hoster, mm -hmm. or go to some service that you could do that. Where in the stack do you have value and where is it important? You care about your data, you care about your applications, which ones can you get off the shelf and which ones do you actually have to be involved in? Um, so absolutely, it's a hybrid world, but Public cloud is just growing gangbusters. You, you look at Azure, you look at AWS, you look at Google. Um, there, there's huge growth in those numbers and not something we think is anywhere close to the high watermark that they're going to reach. Uh, so th there, there's lots of room for growth and uh, I know we've got some data from Wikibon we'll, we'll talk about uh, as we move forward. Yeah, and I think what you're also seeing, um, just in terms of, of these hybrid environments, um, a lot of organizations are wanting to take advantage of best-in-class applications and best-in-class platforms, and there are different environments that are that are kind of optimized for those specific use cases. Um, and also, uh, folks want to be able to take advantage of um, multiple open-source frameworks, which um, lends itself to um, being able to combine, you know, on-premise and, and private and public um, cloud environments. And so, I think again, the the, the increasing, um, you know, reliance and interest in open source is also driving these hybrid environments for the foreseeable future. I wonder how much you think the uh, trend toward hybrid uh, deployment is being driven by legacy infrastructure, the need to maintain mm -hmm. legacy infrastructure, uh, perhaps some fear of, of uh, going too deeply into this 
whole new world. And, and over time, as more companies assume a cloud-first approach, will we see a tipping point at which public cloud becomes the, the favored platform? Yeah, well, it's, it's an interesting question, because um, I think one of the reasons why we've seen a little bit of a dip in the, in the public cloud um, percentage this year is just the overall cost perception of the public cloud. The initial perce perception was that um, you know this is certainly going to be uh, an exponential cost savings to the organizations to think about public cloud versus private versus you know hybrid environments. Um, but I think we're seeing, and, and we'll get to this a little bit later, just the overall you know complexity of, of some of these public cloud environments and the tools that you have to adopt and and some of the managed service providers that you have to consider. Um, net to the to the to the user it actually the costs are, are increasing a bit um, and so I think we may see some equilibrium over time in, in, in public versus private and really wanting to have more control yeah uh, let's take a look at how those cloud dollars are being allocated customer investments in public cloud technologies I'm we're sp referring specifically to public cloud here I don't think any surprise that SAS is uh, overwhelmingly the the revenue leader uh, but we saw we see nice growth in infra infrastructure as a service and very strong growth in, in platform as a service and, and Holly maybe you can speak first to the uh, the compound annual growth rates in in pass as we see 33 percent over the last year uh, where's that going yeah, I mean, I think we're going to continue to see, uh, you know, accelerated uh, growth in, in, in the platform as a service ecosystem, just as people really want to be able to take advantage of, you know, API frameworks and, and, and deep integrations as these they adopt these, you know, what we're seeing as kind of industry-specific or application-specific um, cloud environments. Um, you know, they really want to be able to, you know, integrate any, everything that they um, need to deliver whatever service they're providing or, or products that they're providing. Um, and so these, these platforms, I think, are, are going to continue to, to, to grow um, you know, at the rates that we've seen uh, historically. Uh, Stu, why platform as a service? Why now? So uh, it's interesting. I mean, Paul, platform as a service is the smallest of all of these numbers. And uh, you know, I, I think back to the cloud discussions we've had for the last decade. Um, if you look at the, these, these are Wikibon numbers, by the way, that we're showing on, on, the, on the chart. Two thirds of the data is SaaS. And SaaS is still growing at a significant clip and is going to be most of the data. Infrastructure as a service is the next piece, but it's the services that are really where most of the value is. Um, platform as a service has been something we've kind of tried at a whole bunch of times, and there's been some good growth in uh, you know what you see uh, GE doing with Predix, with Pivotal, uh, with uh, you know Red Hat, with OpenShift. A lot of uh, good solutions out there that are starting to get uh, good traction, uh, but containers. Uh, just in general, if you, we've seen containerized services in all of the cloud solutions as well as on-premises offerings with, of course, Docker helping to bring that to the masses, and the recent serverless technologies, which uh, you know Microsoft, Google, uh, Amazon with uh, th their Lambda offering, uh, provide some of the same type of uh, you know, flexibility that customers want is I want to be able to, the platform as a service uh, and containers and services, I get closer to the application and helping me not care bit as much about the infrastructure underneath it. And you know, that, that's kind of that, that uh, you know, uh, nirvana that people have been looking at for many years is I care about my data, I care about my applications. You know, can't I let somebody else worry about the plumbing, but it, it's complicated and it's challenging. And uh, as uh, Holly mentioned, you know, cloud is not getting any simpler. We keep adding lots of new services. Uh, there's more competition out there. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of uh, pieces that it would be nice if it was easier. And that's what platform as services help uh, to attack. So, you know, that portability that, uh, you know, really being able to encapsulate whether it's microservices or my application and keep it independent of, of whatever platform or infrastructure that it's on top of. As you look, uh, Wikibon looks out in its forecasts, uh, do you see the SaaS, uh, IaaS uh, divide equaling out at some point? Is, is the infrastructure growth, the growth in the infrastructure market actually going to accelerate uh, past the growth in the SaaS market, or, or is SaaS on top to stay for a, while, a long time? Yeah, no, we, we see SaaS staying staying on top, and because SaaS is going to sit on top of some of that infrastructure, but it's you know thin revenue margins if I'm just a, a layer that, sa that, uh, that the SaaS sits on top of it. Um, we see the line between infrastructure as service and platform as service many times as blurring. Uh, you know, you, you look at companies like Oracle and how they, they do it, they offer kind of the pieces together. Amazon has never bought into those definitions uh, that people put in, and as they start moving up the stack and adding more services, uh, they kind of integrated it into my previous comments about how containers and serverless uh, fit in. Uh, it's, you know, is it just infrastructure? Is it infrastructure plus, PaaS minus? Uh, where, where does that all fit in? It's definitely 
uh, you know, something that uh, you know, we keep constantly look at over, over time. Uh, Holly, as you have witnessed this big shift to software as a service over the last five years or so, it's hardly any, company, any startups I can think of anymore that are, that are coming out with on-premise uh, applications. How, how, what's the nature of these companies? How has the, the structure and the, uh, the strategy of these companies changed as they've adopted a SaaS first model? Yeah, I mean, I think it's all really focused on um, you know the integration of, of IT and, and product teams, making sure that those are really closely aligned, um, and also that it, as we were talking through before the go-to-market strategy, um, where these traditional you know enterprise um, on-premise uh, software businesses were t typically really large um, direct sales forces, and and so I think one of the biggest shifts that we've seen is is um, you know the ability, the different you know channels through which you can acquire um, a massive customer base. Uh, we're seeing a lot of businesses that are adopting you know, freemium models to kind of land grab and then figure out how to convert those customers once they have them already starting to use the platform, uh, which I think is a really interesting uh, business model shift. And, and how, does that, how does that affect their growth rate, by the way? I mean, do you, you see these companies as growing at the same rate as the, the on-prem companies of old? Are they fast, going faster? I mean, I think, um, you know, over time, probably if you look at the trends, it, it will, you know, even out just because, you know, they are providing, you know, mi mission critical applications that, you know, these businesses need to, to buy. So I think, um, you know, when, when software was first introduced, it didn't matter what the business model was because there was one business model and that's how you bought. Um, and so people wanted to be able to adopt um, these technologies regardless um, but I think one thing that we are seeing um, in, in the SaaS world is just um, you know the, the 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 ability to to grow faster just because of the pace of innovation um, and the fact that you can deliver um, you know in real time up updates to, to your mm -hmm. customers it really helps you know retention which again is going to be able to drive growth um, over time uh, what are they doing in the cloud? Well, one big thing they're doing is storing data. So let's take a look at our next slide. Kind of a lot going on here, so let's tease this out. 28% uh, of companies say that they're storing over half of their data uh, in, in a public cloud, and those who are storing over half their data in the public cloud expect it to grow strongly, 18%. 59% uh, storing half of their data in, uh, in a private cloud. I guess not surprising. Uh, but the uh, company storing over half of their data in a private cloud expected to actually decrease 16%. And I guess I was a little surprised to see that the, that, that number is, is declining. Uh, were either of you? Uh, um, yeah, no, I actually w w wasn't surprised to see that, just given the pace of, of, of the number of you know, security companies and, and, and security products and, and tools and managed services that are you know, solely focused on figuring out how to secure um, you know, public cloud environments. Um, it is, you know, uh, businesses are created with that, with that sole focus in mind, and so I think we've seen a tremendous um, uh, improvement in, in, that, um, in that area, and it will just continue to, to get better. Yeah. Over time. And, and so, in addition to kind of knocking down some of the barriers uh, there that the, the ecosystem is doing, I, I think this verified exactly what I was hearing at mm -hmm. AWS this year, which was um, if you look at kind of the spend in the cloud, uh, public cloud has tended to be very compute heavy mm -hmm. uh, applications. Um, what uh, I talked to a number of companies uh, that were formed for doing on premises data analytics, kind of the, the data lake, if you will, um, and almost every single one of them said, oh my God, in the last kind of 12 months, it's all going to the public cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, just analytics is, you know, uses a lot of compute, it's very bursty, and therefore it's a great fit for kind of the, uh, the cost structure of public cloud. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's one of those great, you know, where's data live? It's like, well, we're going to take my data lake, we're going to stick it up in the cloud, uh, and uh, we're going to be able to get great value out of that. So, uh, that shift is happening, but as we said in the previous slide, you know, hybrid is where it is, so we're seeing a shift, but it's not everything going into the public cloud mm -hmm. or everything staying there, but, you know, data's tough, uh, it's tough to move it. We saw Amazon roll out you know, not only little appliances, but a whole truck called a snowmobile uh, that they can take, uh, it's a hundred petabytes uh, worth of data. Um, but I mean, that, that takes months to load that up and move it. So, um, you know, moving my applications, moving my data is not something that is, you know, just snap a finger and it's done. Uh, but as, as a long-term shift, uh, you know, this is exactly what I expected to say. And I think one, you know, proof point that supports this data is the fact that we're even seeing, you know, government agencies starting to adopt uh, public cloud strategies. I think that's something that we, we didn't think would get to. For yeah, one. yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think we've gotten to that point a lot faster than maybe people thought we would have. And, and this really ties back to the security issue, which we'll touch on later, and there's some, some interesting findings there. Uh, I, I wonder, is data, so is, Stu, do you think the big data is sort of the killer app for, uh, for moving 
large data stores to the cloud? So uh, our CEO uh, at, at SiliconANGLE Media, uh, Dave Vellante, said, you know, big data gives the cloud something to do. Uh, so it, 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 it's, uh, it's a nice pithy line, but it really does sum up. Um, if you look at kind of the cost structure, um, you know, storing a lot of data in the cloud, isn't necessarily that expensive, but if it was a constant workload under kind of a, a constant activity, um, you kind of have that rent versus buy, and uh, the, the cost structure of public cloud might not necessarily fit. Mm -hmm. But if you've got something that, uh, you know, I want to do a lot with it and then kind of extract it and do various activities with it, well, that's what cloud's great at. I've got a thousand services, I can plug lots of things in, um, I can do exactly what I need to do, but do it in, you know, minutes or hours as opposed to let's spend six months or 12 months mm -hmm. getting all the gear and setting it all up and testing it. I want to I want to move fast and get my results now. Yeah, and I think it was actually interesting, just on, uh, going back to the security um, piece again, I think we saw half of our respondents th viewed security as an inhibitor, and actually 50% viewed security as a, a positive aspect of the, of the public cloud. So it was, it was interesting to see that it was, it was very evenly split across the board. Yeah, that's a, uh, uh, that, that's a, a data point I'd, I'd like you to comment on. I'm not sure if that's in our in our survey results, so let's, let's talk about that now. As you said, half of respondents said exactly, said the, said security is inhibitor, and half mm -hmm. say it's an enabler. So kind of a, uh, uh, I mean, talk about a split personality, uh, is that a, does that mean that the public cloud, is the perception of public cloud as being secure actually growing and improving? Uh, which which number is going to move which way? Yeah, so we, we did a survey at Wikibon uh, a few years ago, and if you split it with, I'm using public cloud a lot, or I'm thinking about public cloud, the people that are thinking about public cloud had this wall built up. Security is a challenge, and I'm really worried. Once they dove in and, and kind of got used to the water, uh, they understood, oh, security's different, but it's a real opportunity because you know that we we've joke about this a bunch. But go to any company and say you know are you really happy with the security that you've got in your data center? The answer is never. Oh yes, glowing. I'm super excited about it. So the cloud is an opportunity for us to change. Change doesn't necessarily mean better, but uh, it, with the, the software products that are coming out, mm -hmm. uh, the, the new ways to do security a li little bit differently. And by the way, it's a hybrid world, so you know how do I manage, you know what I have and where my data lives everywhere. It's definitely something that companies need to address. Uh, and you know I, I th think there's that nuance there of you know is it a challenge? Is it an opportunity? The answer is yes, uh, and therefore we get kind of that split brain result. Yeah, and in, in the growth equity world, we're seeing a, a, a rapid, rapid growth in in these managed s uh, service providers that are focused, you know, uh, solely on securing public clouds. So mm -hmm. I think people are just seeing, gee, you know, there are a lot of different companies emerging. They're only focused on this area, um, you know. So, so it's it, it's probably going to end up being, you know, just as secure. Yeah, secure. the best security minds are going right. to the public cloud now. Really, let's uh, jump ahead to our next uh, question: drivers. Why do people move to the cloud? Uh, you see an interesting shift last year, which was supported by this year's results as well. The scalability, the number one consistently across the six years of the survey, but cost we see mm -hmm. dropping to uh, to third place, and agility jumping up from fourth place to second place. So it seems to me that this would represent a uh, an evolution of thinking, really another st another stage of of maturity in thinking when we see that the that the cloud's benefits are enabling business faster. Uh, mm -hmm. Would either of you care to comment on this? Yeah, so there, there's a few questions in the survey that really highlighted for me. Uh, customers look at, they look at SaaS, they look at infrastructure as service and pass as, uh, from an agility standpoint, it's fast. And by fast, it's how fast do you expect results? There was like 25, 20, 25% of uh, respondents say, that's like immediately. Mm -hmm. It's, I swipe a credit card or I press a button in my GUI and it's ready there. And almost everybody expects results in less than three months. Right. You know, we know from kind of the traditional world, just going through the procurement process, getting something shipped on site, getting somebody to you know, help with the setup, even if it's something that's really simple, is you know, you're talking weeks and months, um, not immediate to three months as kind of the, the mm -hmm. outlier there. So that, that really spoke to a kind of a huge value prop of cloud in general. Yeah, and, and again, just on on the cost side again, I know we we, we mentioned some of this previously, but um, I think you know large organizations are still still trying to figure out what their their real you know cloud governance um, strategy is, and until that's really refined, and it should be adopted really from 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 the outset of of, of adopting cloud, um, you know there are some cost um, pockets that are, are are just you know exceeding perhaps what what the you know initial budgets were, um, so that's why it's maybe no longer a driver, um, but but in some cases maybe an inhibitor. Yeah, and. and 
just that's yeah. definitely one of the, the the hot buttons. If you say, what are you concerned about? What are you worried about? You know, the CFO doesn't want uncertainty, right? right. He right. wants the, you know, it, it's usually okay. Surprises. Here's what I expect, and no, I don't want surprises. Right. So cloud providers are working through that. Um, I, you know, I, I look at what I'm using. How do I set up circuit breakers? How do I understand mm -hmm. what my usage? How do, right? I'm, I'm not going to be you know, oh, I have that teenager that all of a sudden you know my internet bill uh, you know went uh, you know off the rails. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know we don't want that to happen in business either. Yeah, they want to test fast, but also you know test as appropriate in controlled environments. There may be a realization that the cloud is not really as cheap maybe as some people would it may have thought it was at one point. Yeah. It, it, it depends what you're doing because right. what, what's fascinating watching public cloud, Amazon especially, is pretty good at eating its own when it comes to you know lowering prices. So they came out a few years ago with uh, AWS Trusted Advisor, which you know kind of looks at everything you're doing and saying, oh, you can actually dial down this usage or, or change what you're doing. Uh, the, the case studies that they put forth from a serverless architecture is if I was doing AWS before and I went serverless, it's going to knock off like 60% plus uh, of my cost mm -hmm. uh, because I'm, I'm using things down at that kind of microservices level and only when I need it. So, you know, really dropping that cost and, you know, we, we see other cloud providers uh, trying to help customers get a handle on uh, yeah. the cloud. Increased and, transparency and just yeah. on what the model really is. All right, yeah. Uh, digging down one more level, uh, as we move to the next slide in what is driving cloud adoption, we see uh, interesting, uh, interesting that mobile and open source are uh, twice as likely to be cited as a driver for cloud computing in 2016 versus 2015. So that's a big change in just one year. And this really sort of goes back to the, to, to the digital business uh, topic we were discussing earlier. Digital businesses usually include an elements of open source and mobile as well as cloud infrastructure. So. Uh, Double, uh, doubly uh, the rate uh, in, in one year in the survey, was, were either of you surprised by that? I mean, I think one of the driver of, of you know, that um, big jump is what we were talking to just around containerized environments and you know, the open source Kubernetes project. Um, you know, people are finally actually going into production with some of these containerized environments. It's not just testing, but actually going full into production. Um, so I think that that's a driver. And just you know, in general, you know, the, the, the concept of open source is you know, open, you know, collaborative development, which which drives you know increased innovation, and it's also um, prompting for uh, you know commercialization of, of these open source projects. And so a number of companies are are emerging and, and growing quite rapidly, commercializing um, open source projects like WordPress, so one of our portfolio companies, WP Engine. Um, it's just a tremendous opportunity. Yeah, and, and Paul, if if you look, uh, one of the things we always look at is, is there any bias in the sample size we're getting? Mm -hmm. So uh, there there's certain ones you say, oh, the Linux Foundation actually did a great job of pulling in a lot of uh, users here. Well, there's going to be a lot of open source. Uh, Microsoft is one of the platinum providers. Microsoft has been doing a ton with open source, something the community is super excited about. So if Microsoft was kind of you know one of the paragons of proprietary in the past, and even they are doing open source, we understand how much it's growing. Um, you know, one of the th things, uh, Holly, I'm, I'm curious just on your commentary mm -hmm. from the vendor side. You know, the question is always, well, how do they make money? If they do, they grow as fast. Do they make as much margin and revenue uh, with business that's driven a lot by open source? as they did in the past. Yeah, I mean, I think the answer to that is yes, and we're seeing proof of that in, within our portfolio. You know, as I mentioned, you know, WP Engine, which provides infrastructure uh, platform and, and, and software tools for WordPress applications, really driving that digital experience. People want to be able to take advantage of these um, highly innovative open source communities, um, but there are some concerns around it being open source, and that tends to be around performance, scalability, and security. And so a lot of these commercializing vendors are, are um, uh, kind of taking that away and and kind of solving for that while you know continuing to to innovate on top of these open source ecosystems, even at a perhaps um, more accelerated rate than the community uh, itself. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Red Hat actually just celebrated 10 years on the New York Stock Exchange this mm -hmm. week. They've got their earnings coming out, and it's been you know the, just the best proof point of you know how to grow a business on open source. And, and lots of people have been, lots of companies have been following uh, in their in their path. Are you seeing Holly any emerging models in open source that that are? Or are you seeing any coalescence around? certain business models in open source that are demonstrably uh, uh, proven, that are profitable, that, that are long term. So there still is uh, uh, some question about whether pure open source models, the, the sort of support function, is a viable long term business. Uh, what models are you seeing working? I mean, I think if those um, support organizations are, are continuing to 
to, to innovate and then accelerate it, right? So they're continuing to move up the stack in terms of the valuing that, that they're providing to their end customers. If it's a purely a support function, unless it's a truly you know mission critical application, you know like C C MySQL environments, for example, um, where support is is critical to ensure um, uh, uptime and, and performance across the board. Um, if these organizations continue to move up that stack and provide software that goes deeper into whatever an application they're addressing, um, I think that is certainly viable um, for for the long term with using these open source um, ecosystems as a foundation. Uh, uh, Stu, open source cloud, is there any reason those two should be synonymous? Um, they're not synonymous today. Uh, definitely uh, open source is used to build mm -hmm. all of the clouds that are out there. Uh, yet, uh, you know, if I take the three biggest clouds out there, uh, you know, Google, Microsoft, and Amazon, uh, all of them use open source. We mentioned Microsoft's been going that way a lot. Uh, you know, there's, there's many really big open source projects that wouldn't exist if it wasn't for what Google had done. Uh, and Amazon uh, has definitely taken some critique as to uh, not giving back to open source. Uh, there was a lot of discussion uh, at the AWS reInvent show about MXNet, uh, what they're using kind of the machine learning uh, space and giving back. And uh, Holly mentioned containerization. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's a lot that uh, Amazon's talking about, kind of how we put the open source together, uh, how we really put it together as a service to help customers. So absolutely, uh, open source and cloud go well together together, but definitely not synonymous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we were talking about drivers, let's move to inhibitors. Our next slide, uh, and a very interesting shift between last year's study and this, in terms of the, the leading inhibitor. And the one that jumps right out at us, I think, is, is that lock-in moves from fourth uh, to second on the list of primary inhibitors. Um, why? I thought cloud was, uh, provided flexibility and ease of movement from one to another. What's this lock-in thing? Yeah, uh, so you know we're, we've got another slide talking about kind of multi-cloud and how mm -hmm. that fits in. Uh, there, there's definitely a gap here as when we put that hybrid solution in place. You know, how does that work um, from a lock-in standpoint? Uh, from a buying standpoint, uh, the more volume I do with a single provider, you know, I, I get greater leverage and the services that I build on top of the base platform, uh, they're different between <laughs> all, all the different environments. Uh, so, you know, if I, if I just, you know, buy compute and storage, I can probably switch uh, from one cloud pr provider to another, but the real value is when I can go up the stack and I'm using a database offering, an analytics offering, and if I write an application one way, it's a lot of work to rewrite it uh, for, for another one. So there is that, mm -hmm. that lock in there. It's definitely uh, something that's bubbled up a qu quite a bit that we've seen. Yeah, data portability is, is, is increasingly important we're seeing that across all of our, our, our companies. They don't want to feel as though their data is trapped in, in one environment. They want to be able to, you know, for whatever reason, be as nimble as they thought they would um, have had the opportunity to be by, by taking advantage of cloud in the, in the, at the first place. Um, so they really want that, that, that portability of their data. Is this a problem for cloud providers, this fear of lock-in? Or is just a, I mean, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting growth opportunity for, for service providers to figure out how to you know, or orchestrate these multi-cloud environments and, and port that data and integrate um, ac across you know, these multi-cloud environments. So I think it's a, a, you know, uh, a growth opportunity for a lot, of, a lot of companies out there. Yeah, th there's a lot of startups that are trying to mm -hmm. fill this gap right now and help fill this, but I, I think over the long term, it's something that the, the platforms themselves need to help with. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the dynamic here though? I mean, Microsoft certainly prospered with a lock-in strategy for many years. Uh, is, is it in Amazon's interest to prevent lock-in, or quite the opposite? Uh, would we uh, see Amazon uh, trying to find new ways to, to lock customers in? Yeah, I, I, Paul, I mean, you're exactly right. It's, you know, you, you build a platform, you build the ecosystem, but you want you want developers to be writing to what you're doing, and it's in, the, you know, that, you know, Amazon's interest, it's in Google's interest, mm -hmm. Microsoft's interest, that they want to be, you know, they want you to be the, their platform. You know, gaming, you know, you don't see PlayStation and Xbox, you know, all saying, oh, well, you know, hey, you can write code across both of ours and you make it real easy. It's, it's always that certain standards work, but it's the standards plus, here's the value we add, here's why we're the best place for your application, your data, or your game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and to Holly's point, it is a, an opportunity for yeah. uh, providers who can, who can solve that problem. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, just one other worth commenting on, uh, complexity uh, ticks up a little bit in this survey as an issue. 
Uh, is the cloud, do you think this is a, a realization that as companies move more of their operations to the cloud, that this is not really all that simple? Uh, or is the cloud itself becoming more complex? Yeah, the cloud itself is definitely yeah, becoming more absolutely. complex. We, we, we saw, you know, once again, we're using Amazon as the example, but they're going to make a thousand, you know, significant announcements, either major upgrades or new services that are available. Something um, every morning when you wake up. Yeah, three of them yeah. every day. Uh, and so that's why uh, we're starting to see, you know, the, in, in the data, you know, customers are looking to, you know, partners and, you know, integrators mm -hmm. and managed service providers to help them with this because I can no longer be an expert on everything that's out there. Historically, has complexity been a problem for the software industry? It seems like software almost always becomes more, it always becomes it's more really complex. It's really hard to make things easy, right? Yeah. I mean, that is the, the biggest challenge that a lot of you know our companies are seeing. Like, how can we make this as easy as possible? Because over time, as you add functionality and, and you go broader, uh, you know, across, you know, either horizontally or deeper into verticals, you know, the, the nature of that is is adding some element of complexity, but how can you, you know, provide, you know, the customers with what they want in a really, you know, simple easy to use uh, experience is, is really hard to do. The, the difference we have is, you know, cloud is not, you know, one box I'm selling. It's here's a platform and there's lots of things I can layer on top of it. So you get to choose what tools you're using, choose how you integrate with it. Uh, you know, th there is lots of choice in there, but, you know, boy, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's the paradox of choice when you go out there because mm -hmm. uh, there's lots of options out there and even in any platform, there's so many different pieces that I have to choose from and it's changing so fast. I mean, this, I I in IT in general, keeping up with the pace of change uh, is, you know, it, it's no longer software being released, you know, once every 12 to 18 months. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, you've now got code being released, you know, every day and, you know, from everybody out there and, you know, plenty of companies are pushing it, pushing it, you know, every couple of weeks. So, uh, you know, keeping up with that is, you know, a Hercule Herculean task. And uh, per perhaps uh, uh, a synonym for complexity would be choice. Yep, absolutely. Let's move ahead to our next uh, finding about the emerging areas of cloud investment. Uh, Stu, you were talking about uh, big data as uh, <laughs> giving cloud something to do. That seems to be justified in the 58% uh, of our respondents are, are interested in analytics. 52% in containers. Now when you think that containers, two years ago most people hadn't even heard of containers, now we've got over half of our respondents saying that's a primary draw. Uh, what strikes you about that finding? Yeah, it, it was a little surprising to yeah. see so high on a few of these. Even you know, AI and cognitive um, is is another t topic. You know, Paul, I know you've been at uh, you know some of the events talking about cognitive computing, and you've got a third of respondents saying that you know this is where we're going to put an investment in. So um, the the thing that I found is companies that are doing cloud are usually a little bit you know on the earlier part of the adoption curve, uh, and they're looking for ways to help their business run better. So. Analytics absolutely is a huge opportunity. We've mm -hmm. been uh, talking for the last few years. You know, data is the new oil. So if I understand how to, yeah. you know, process that and get value out of it, that's phenomenal. Um, containers uh, is you know something that's really you know taken the market by storm uh, and is something that you know lots of people. Uh, you know, I've talked to plenty of practitioners that have gone from that what is it to yup, I'm, I've got my strategy and I'm, I'm starting to roll it out. It's easy to go faster uh, on these and you know some of the emerging areas. It's easier for me to at least start dabbling with it, uh, I, it, I don't have to spend a million dollars uh, to start playing with it. Right, right, and, and on the analytics side, we're seeing a lot of you know, continuous data I integration really enabling uh, real-time analytics, and that's you know kind of across the board. And, and in terms of you know business applications, it's you know uh, improving development, imp improving customer service. It's really how how do we make everything real-time and continuous so that we're uh, we're always better. We're always providing better um, product, better service to our customers. Is cloud inherently a better analytics platform than on-prem, or does it really make a difference? So. If I'm in a cloud, the, the question is, what services do I have mm -hmm. available to myself? Right. So, you know, if I do a private cloud, I, I, I can I can do a lot with the analytics. Uh, I, I've worked with companies that say, um, you know, you've got resources. How can I take advantage of the spare bandwidth that I have to be able to run my analytics, uh, do things at night? So, it, it's not only public cloud, but um, th there's lots of ways I can do analytics. The more services that I have access to, the easier it's going to be. Public cloud gives you a lot of that. Uh, many of the managed service providers will give you access to multiple clouds. You see cloud exchanges out there uh, where I don't necessarily need to live on that platform to be able to plug into what is either a rack away or direct connect like what Amazon and Microsoft have 
uh, in their environment. So, you know, we're a highly interconnected world. Networking has always been one of those challenges and something that the industry as a whole has been knocking down and dealing with along with security, as Holly's been saying, is yeah. kind of, I always look back, networking and security is something we've been struggling with for, gosh, the last 25, 30 years to get that, that kind of XSP model we talked about back in the 90s, the whole internet, the, the whole cloud space, and uh, we're, we're making really good progress lately, and that just unlocks a lot of opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and your point to that, there are a lot of different, you know, clouds developed Developing, you know, nearly 50% of our, our of our respondents to our survey said that you know they will be or have already started to adopt um, industry-specific cloud uh, environments, which I think is really interesting. You know, as we think about you know financial services, for example, and all that is involved in in uh, in, in you know being able to uh, uh, innovate with, with cloud-based offerings. It's really truly a kind of industry-specific cloud that they're thinking about. And, and further reflecting the maturation of cloud as Absolutely. it as it becomes more vertical. Just touch quickly on the 16% who mentioned virtual reality. Uh, uh, this virtual reality is still a, a, a nascent market, but you would think with the amount of compute power that virtual reality requires, that the cloud would be a natural platform uh, for it. Are, are you, um, any comment on that number? Yeah, we, we it's, it's a little early from uh, the, the, we, the space that I covered. We don't see a lot yeah. of uh, a virtual reality in, in our portfolio um, yet, um, just given that we're on, on the growth equity side, so these are companies that are a little bit more mature, um, but we're certainly keeping our eye on it. When we become comfortable with seeing people wearing those goggles on the subway, <laughs> exactly. I suppose that's when virtual reality takes off. Uh, moving on to sales channels, uh, direct, uh, and let's back up one slide. Direct still dominates, but indirect and especially VARs up 3x versus last year. That's a big jump. And VARs, I would think of value add resellers more traditionally a, a hardware business. VARs, you're, you're talking about managed service providers in this case, uh, would you say? Is that where the VAR channel is going? Yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of different channels to think about in terms of these, you know, more application specific and, and, and vertical specific, you know, cloud environments are, are being taken to market. Um, it could be, you know, consultants, it could be, you know, agencies, for example, digital agencies that are um, adding value on top of, you know, the cloud environment that you're um, providing to your uh, to your customer. Um, again, a lot of these businesses are trying to figure out their, um, it has to be really easy um, to, to, to buy online, so that's that high velocity, low touch sales model that I mentioned um, without abandoning you know the, the truly high-end enterprise opportunity and so a lot of folks are, are seeking um, you know multiple different channel um, uh, providers whether it's MSPs or agencies as I mentioned or um, kind of s uh, specialty consultants uh, to help them bring um, their uh, products to market and, and provide you know transparency and uh, ease of adoption to those end customers. And, and Paul, to your point, if a company was selling boxes before, they probably figured out what solutions are they selling, what services they're laying, laying, layering on top of that, and what services do they, do they need to be able to plug in and offer to their uh, customers. And especially if you look at this not just as public cloud, but as hybrid, uh, that's where they tie into it. Um, th th this data was really interesting because mm -hmm. not only has it tripled from last year, but there was a question saying, okay, uh, I, I think the numbers are on 9% right now say that they're buying through some managed service provider or integrator or something like that, and they look out two years from now, that number number triples. Right. So I think it speaks to what we were talking about earlier is that complexity of the cloud. Um, I can't be the expert to everything myself, so I've got to go either go to the platform or go to the vendors and be able to shift mm -hmm. um, You know who has the expertise on that. That doesn't necessarily mean outsourcing, um, but it does mean that uh, you know I, I'm, I'm leaning on resources to be able to do that. Um, when, when we, Paul, you mentioned at the beginning, a true private cloud, uh, at Wikibon we see uh, about $150 billion a year of uh, you know, operational expense that is going to shift over the kind of the next five years or so to be able to say people running around, you know, racking, stacking, cabling, fixing, tweaking, you know, turning knobs and optimizing, that's going to shift to platforms, that's going to shift to partners, and, you know, this result of having the channel partners get involved more I is a, you know, direct alignment with what, you know, we expect to see. For our, just uh, digging into do these business models, I is this mostly a case of VARs lifting and shifting an existing strategy? In other words, they specialized in automating legal firms or educational institutions, and they're simply doing that on a different platform now, or are you seeing the business models for these resellers change fundamentally? as a result of having this different platform. Yeah, I mean, I actually think they're able to attract um, uh, better business models um, this way because they're able to charge subscriptions for their ongoing, you know, management and, more and sustainable. services. Yeah, it's much more sustainable. There's much more visibility into their um, businesses. So I actually think we're seeing a lot of uh, attractive investment opportunities in those 
uh, you know, managed service or kind of specialty consultant um, businesses that really figure out a way to have these long-term, um, highly specialized relationships with their customers. Um, so it's not just um, selling them and, and potentially migrating them to whatever environment um, uh, they're transitioning to, but it's also uh, providing a value-added service on an ongoing basis over multi multiple years. And just building on that, VAR Channel traditionally has been very regionalized, mm -hmm. it's been very specialized, localized. Of course, you get with cloud, you get global for free. Uh, you have the potential of expanding your your uh, uh, your reach significantly beyond where VARs have traditionally been focused. Are you seeing in the companies you're investing in, are you seeing companies take advantage of that? Um, I, so I think um, it's easier to go um, more broadly uh, on a geogra from a geographic perspective, but I think people are still trying to be you know, specialized such that they can really add that value on top of just, you know, as I mentioned, kind of the migration and, and, and sales process. Um, so I think they're still trying to be specialized either from an application perspective or a vertical perspective, but can go more broadly uh, on a geographic basis. Yeah, and, and governance and compliance really yeah. is, you know, it, I need to understand that vertical and I need to understand that, that locality. Right. Uh, you know, yes, it can be global, but most things are aren't fully global, it's, uh, yeah, I might, you know, want a, want a marketplace that's open to the globe, but, you know, where my data lives, where my workforce interacts, the security things that I'm worried about, there, there's, there's a lot of reasons why I still need, you know, people in my local environment that understand my business. Still takes a village. Yeah. Uh, well, let's move ahead to our, our last couple of slides here. Uh, pass, uh, we asked about whether uh, platform as a service and IaaS vendor relationships are strategic and, and found that 61% of companies say they're using just one PaaS or IaaS vendor. Now, considering that flexibility of moving your workloads was one of the initial appeals of the cloud, were either of you surprised by this finding? Um, a little bit, Paul, but you know, as we, we talked about earlier, if I want to build up the stack, um, if the cloud I have has the applications that I want, uh, I'm, I'm going to choose it. Platform as a service, I, I think it makes sense that it's going to be one. It's, you know, I'm, I'm choosing paths for, for flexibility, but infrastructure as a service, number one, if I do multiple platforms, how do I integrate with them? How do I train across most of them? You know, companies always say I want a heterogeneous environment, but it's a lot easier for me as, as an IT organization if I can choose uh, you know, a single piece. Um, but kind of those capabilities and pricing are things that I need to trade off. Um, and how do I make sure I've got access to my data and that portability um, even if I am choosing a single platform? Yeah, and I think for, for a lot of you know, our businesses that are um, uh, you know, I in the business of, of you know providing software as a service, they're typically you know thinking about one really strategic relationship that they can go deep with, um, especially in just in the stage of company in which we're investing, which is kind of you know that you know 15 to 100 million of revenue range. Um, they're not yet you know at the point where they want to uh, go multi-cloud, but um, perhaps just become a little bit more strategic with. We saw earlier that the uh, fear of lock-in has become a prim primary inhibitor. This would indicate that lock-in is not such a bad thing. At least these companies, uh, the what's the difference between lock-in and strategic relationship? Yeah, I mean, we, we always have to make those decisions and those trade-offs, but once you've made that decision, you know, you, you want to have a good, strong relationship, and if you keep hopping around, you're, you're not going to have that deeper relationship. Yeah. Um, it, 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 this, Paul, definitely is something I've had the most heated debates with uh, after being at the AWS show, uh, and, you know, how that kind of hybrid multi-cloud world lives is, is something we're, we're still sorting out a bit, uh, but it, it seems we're kind of getting towards where uh, it, it is going to end up. Final, final data point, the importance of constant product iteration surges, and this really goes back to a point that we saw earlier, the importance of agility as a driver of cloud. We see, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, a, a rapid adoption of DevOps, a, a form of application development that enables uh, agility. Uh, do you see the, this finding as, as just validating the earlier point about agility growing as a cloud uh, attraction of the cloud? Yeah, I think so, and I think what it really is showing is that you know IT resources are no longer um, you know kind of bogged down with with you know choosing and building out infrastructure. It's really becoming more of a, a revenue generating center for these companies, and and a lot of our portfolio companies are figuring out how to more closely integrate you know IT IT departments in this broader um, product development um, discussion, um, so that they can you know be agile and and, and uh, you know develop at the speed in which they would like. Yeah, and, and I think this speaks to the maturity that we're seeing in kind of you know what what's happening in cloud. It's not just about oh something's cheaper or yeah I think it's a little bit faster, but organizationally uh, I'm changing the way I, I streamline the, the relationship between IT mm -hmm. and the business. How fast uh, I, I can create new products, add value back to the business, um, and you know 
how my entire organization is set up. That that's really what's behind the whole DevOps movement uh, is you know really allowing operations to you know just move a lot faster. Mm -hmm. Going back to that that whole frictionless discussion that we have that cloud's supposed to help enable. We're down to our last two minutes. I want both of you to have a last word. Let's bring up the next slide. Northbridge, putting your money where your mouth is, <laughs> as, as it were, as it were in this uh, area. Talk a little bit about the investments that you're making in cloud right now and the success that you're having. Yeah, sure. I mean, so Northbridge as a as a whole. Um, so I'm with our, our growth equity team and growth equity fund. We also have an affiliated earlier stage venture fund, and we were really investing in cloud before cloud was cloud as traditional, you know, ASP models. And then so we've really seen um, you know the cloud grow up over time. And, and, and continue to, to participate at a pretty uh, aggressive rate. And for us in growth equity, um, it really is all about whether it's you know cloud first or cloud only, um, or you know companies that are going through a transition of, the, of their business model to cloud. Um, it's really all that we're seeing, and, and, and um, uh, you know as, as these results are showing, uh, we're you know given that a lot of our portfolio companies participated and, and collaborated, um, uh, the, the proof points are there, and we we uh, look forward to remaining really active. In, in the space. Certainly an important service you're providing to them. Stu, one minute left, tie this up, put a bow on it. What are the big takeaways from this study? Yeah, so uh, big takeaways is, you know, companies understand, you know, cloud, it's not a fad. Uh, I th think we understand that it's an important driver for how I think about where IT fits in my organization. Uh, you know, IT can not only be important to the business, uh, but can actually be a revenue driver for the whole company. It's, uh, you know, just fundamentally changing, you know, that, that business model. Uh, you know, what business am I in? what should I be doing and what should I be able to shift to kind of partners and platforms uh, and you know cloud we are still in the earlier stages where we're kind of past uh, day one but uh, you know kind of getting you know from the early majority to the to the full majority so um, you know lots of options out there it is not a you know one solution wins uh, uh, across the board but uh, you know it, it does kind of uh, realign uh, you know where margins are where value is uh, and you know Lots of opportunity for uh, customers. You know, we didn't talk too much. You know, jobs are changing. So, uh, you know, if you've been doing the same job for the last five to ten years and you're in the IT space, um, you better look around because uh, you know things are changing really fast. To flip that old Nicholas Carr uh, uh, Harvard Business Review article from 20 years ago on his head, IT does matter. Uh, there's a lot of data here that we didn't get to. There are more than 75 slides in this full deck and it's available to you. You can download it. We will have a URL uh, for that link when we post this video on YouTube, but you can also just go back to the registration page that you used when you registered for this webcast. There are links there to the Northbridge uh, website and links from where you can find the full presentation. It's also, you can look for it on SlideShare along with previous versions of this study, again, now in its sixth year. I want to thank you for joining us for this webcast. Would like to hear you contribute your comments about where you think cloud is going. Join in, contact Northbridge, get involved in the next survey so we can drive that number to 2,000 respondents next year. For now, uh, this is Paul Gillen saying so long, wrapping up here from Wikibon headquarters in Marlboro, Massachusetts. Thanks for joining us today. <laughs>